This episode of Cell and Gene, the podcast is brought to you in partnership with Thermo Fisher Scientific and Applied Biosystems new Qualtrack real-time PCR and digital PCR solutions for biopharma. Give your cell and gene therapy development an edge with reliable and accurate qPCR and dPCR workflows backed by a trusted supplier. Explore the complete ecosystem of CGMP compliant qPCR and dPCR assays, master mixes, and instruments at thermofisher.com slash qPCR slash biopharma. Hello, listeners. Welcome to this episode of Cell and Gene, the podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Harris, and my guest for this episode is Javier San Martin. He is the CMO at Arrowhead Pharmaceuticals, which is a biopharmaceutical company based in Pasadena, California, and they develop medicines that treat intractable diseases by silencing the genes that cause them. And so, Javier, thank you for your time. You're welcome. It's great to be here. Good. I'm so glad. So I just gave a very brief introduction of Arrowhead Pharmaceuticals, but I'd love to hear from you exactly what you're doing and, you know, the broad portfolio of RNA chemistries that you're working with to, to in fact, silence those genes we're talking about. Sure. Well, Arrowhead Pharmaceutical is a um, biotech company based here in Pasadena, Los Angeles, and the main labs where actually a company started is in Madison, Wisconsin. We focus on one, one therapeutic modality that is small interference RNA or RNA interference. People call this differently. And maybe there is a, there is a real difference there. RNA interference is the action to interference with the synthesis of a protein. And a small interference RNA is the actual sequence of RNA that actually does that work. So that's, I think, the easiest way to differentiate these two uh, terms, if you will. So uh, Arrowhead has been going on for over 10 years. Uh, it's one of the key um, companies in RNAi technology. Um, most of the work up to now has been on targeting uh, the liver as the organ to intervene. But the future is uh, really bright and it goes beyond the liver. And maybe we can talk about that a little later. Um, my role, I'm the chief medical officer, typically a chief medical officer of a biotech company is responsible to all the clinical trials, the strategy behind this, all the regulatory interactions, so the interaction with the FDA in, in our country here in the US and with the other um, international regulatory agencies across the world. So what we do is at the lab, we design this sequence of nucleotides, which is what we call RNAi, with some chemistry around, and then we target diseases where the problem is the excess of a given protein or an abnormal protein that causes a disease. So the approach to, to solve that issue, <clears throat> excuse me, is to uh, silence the expression of that gene. So that's the overarching technology that we use. Um, currently, um, in our company, we have a large pipeline of liver target compounds or medicines, or hopefully medicines in the future. And it goes from like hepatitis B, which is a, a molecule licensed to Janssen, to um, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency liver disease, which is a condition in which a protein, when it's normal, help the lung to protect for excess of inflammation, but when the patient has that disease, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, that protein is abnormal, gets accumulated into the liver, cause inflammation, then fibrosis, and eventually end-stage liver disease or cirrhosis. So the goal of therapy there is also inhibit the production of that protein, and by that means enable the liver to clear from that protein and prevent the cascade of inflammation, fibrosis, and then cirrhosis. So that's an example of the variability of the type of conditions that one can address with this technology. The other large component in our pipeline is what we call cardiometabolic drugs. We have right now two of them in either phase two and phase three. I will perhaps um, highlight the, the one that is going through phase two and phase three because it touches different indications or different clinical conditions. 
This is a drug called AeroApoC3, which target a lipoprotein called apolipoprotein C3. Um, so that protein is related to the excess in triglycerides, which is one of the lipids that we have in circulation, related to a number of clinical issues. The patients who have very severe hypertriglyceridemia tend to have pancreatitis. People that have moderate hypertriglyceridemia is a known risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So that same drug, that what it does is go to the liver and inhibit the synthesis of the production of this lipoprotein, protein APOC3. What it does, it has a major effect on decreasing triglycerides and some other lipids as well. And in general terms, the magnitude of the decrease is, for example, 80%. So when you go back to the clinic, or what are the diseases that we can address with this condition? And I will start by the more rare disease, but the more severe one called familial chylomicronemia syndrome. These patients have a genetic uh, mutation that um, have a very high level of this APOC that um, relates to an extremely high level of triglycerides. Just to give you a framework, Normal triglycerides is below 100 milligram deciliters, and these patients tend to have 2,000, 3,000, 5,000. The blood looks like milk. So this drug gets into the liver, which is the organ and the tissue, the hepatocytes, the cells that produce many proteins, including this one. And what it does is uh, inhibit the translation of the gene information into the protein. And it does that in the cytoplasm of the cells. Um, by that mechanism, the triglycerides decline sharply to about 80%. So a person who has 2000 is now getting to the few hundred milligrams per deciliter and go below the threshold at which pancreatitis is uh, frequent. Now, there are a much, this is an, what we call an ultra rare disease, probably about a thousand people in the US. Now, there are another group of patients or people who have more moderate hypertriglyceridemia, and this intervention may be useful as well. And the third population is patients with cardiovascular risk due to this lipidemia. And this lipidemia today, and long time has been categorized in different type of uh, changes or elevation in different type of lipids or lipoproteins, which are the proteins that carry the lipids through circulation. So we're studying this drug on phase two to understand precisely uh, how we can affect these lipids and hopefully translate into clinical benefit for which we need to move into a very large phase three study calling cardiovascular outcome trial. But when you come back to the ultra rare disease, and I'm coming from the background rare and ultra rare disease, diseases, um, it's very few people. So you don't need to wait to the full phase two study to then do a phase three study because it's only 500 to 1,000 patients. These drugs are very predictable. And perhaps that's one of the key pharmacological features. They are predictable, meaning almost everyone has a very similar response, 100% of patient response, and it has a very long duration of therapy, which is approximately three to four months. So patients get a subcutaneous injection four times a year. And essentially all of them achieve what we call the specific pharmacodynamic effect, which is decreased triglycerides in that particular case. Uh, in the case and I mentioned, so let me finish this concept. So that's why we're in phase three. It's only 72 patients, um, but it's really hard to find them because there are very few of them. Now, the good news with rare diseases is oftentimes those patients are known uh, because they are unusual and they have a very severe condition and therefore that helps. So that's our first molecule at Arrowhead that is currently on phase three halfway during the enrollment period. So that is a very exciting process because you know we want to get to that place to make a drug a medicine for patients to benefit from. The example I gave you at the beginning 
on alpha-1 antitrypsin uh, liver disease, the difference is that that protein is abnormal, it's Newton, and that's why it can accumulate in the liver. So the goal of therapy there is to get rid of that protein to allow the liver heal itself. And the liver is an organ that has that um, characteristics as the cells. They regenerate, they, they can regenerate themselves. Um, so uh, we published that phase two study in the New England Journal of Medicine on August 11th. And I think it was a very uh, remarkable uh, thing. This is the first liver disease that is addressed with RNA interface. Um, that molecule is now getting into phase three uh, uh, we did the license with um, Takeda Pharmaceutical for them to run the phase three and take the drug to the market. And that may be allow me to say a few more things about the company itself in terms of the business model. We are a relatively small company, 350 people, and um, we produce a very large number of molecules because this is exactly what we do, design small interference RNA. So we cannot uh, develop all of them in the clinic because that requires a lot of money and structure and people. So we license some of them and approximately 50% of the drug that we design and develop are licensed to larger companies. So when you think about our pipeline, there are about five different companies that are developing drugs that we design uh, and, and develop initially including GSK, Amgen, as an example. Back to our uh, pipeline, uh, we have another cardiometabolic target called um, HPTL3 that has some similarities to the APOC3. And then we're expanding ourselves outside the liver, and that is the next frontier in RNAi. Um, you know, in the last, I would say, 10 years, uh, scientists at Arrowhead, at Al Nylon, which is the larger company on this particular field, figure out the way to deliver this sequence of nucleotides into the liver very effectively. So we, all the companies and academic institutions focusing on RNAi, were focusing on diseases that happen in the liver due to the excess of a given protein or a normal protein that the liver produces and synthesizes and, and delivers. Um, but we're getting to a point that there might not be many more. And that is one of the efforts, how we can find more diseases or conditions that are due to either the excess of a protein produced at the liver or an abnormal protein produced at the liver. So what's the next step? Well, how we can get these drugs into another tissues? And at Arrowhead, perhaps, and we are the first company to do this, we, uh, one of the tissue type that we're focused is the lung, pulmonary delivery of RNAi. And in that case, there is a, uh, the way to deliver this is by nebulization. So it's an inhale, uh, administration as opposed to a systemic subcutaneo that goes to a given tissue. And that is a brand new concept, how we can by nebulizing or inhale these molecules, they get into the lung and they can specifically knocking down a gene that is expressed in the lung. So right now we have two programs on that field, both at the beginning for asthma, severe asthma, one is a type of an anti-inflammatory approach, and the other is more about addressing the mucus accumulation that happen in people, patients with asthma, or perhaps with COPD. So we are on phase one in that study, and that's another really interesting feature of our company. We work from phase one, phase two, and phase three currently, and we work across many different therapeutic areas, which I think to some degree, uh, it's a very distinct feature of what we can do, and particularly considering that we are we're a mid-sized small company. Um, and, and, and so so that is the second one. And the, the third one that I think is very important, and we are at the beginning of that, we haven't disclosed this in detail, but you know, other companies are also looking at, at that particular tissue is the CNS. There are some conditions, including, for example, a subset of patients with ALS that one of the issues is the production of the mutant protein that you can eventually silence with this type of approach. Um, I may pause here and see if you have any question. Um, 
or any other comment that you want me to make. Well, thank you very much for the the explanation of your pipeline and what is to come, what you are expecting, you know, liver versus lung, that's all exceptional information. We were going to get to it regardless. So that's fantastic. Um, I, I do want to take a step back and talk about RNAi versus, perhaps versus isn't the right word, RNAi, gene silencing, gene editing, CRISPR, you know, these are terms that are used constantly, both obviously in the sector and on cell and gene as well. And I was hoping to get from you the similarities, the differences, the circumstances in which one method might be used over the other. Can you talk us through how RNAi is perhaps different or similar to, you know, gene editing and especially how it impacts what you at Arrowhead are working on? Sure. Well, so uh, RNA silence or RNA interference is a physiological process. So nobody invented that. That existed. And that was the reason of the Nobel Prize in 2006, in which we do have this mechanism of a small um, pieces of RNAi that recognize the corresponding sequence of a messenger RNA in the cytoplasm and in the context of a con complex called RIS as able to degrade that messenger RNA. By doing that, you prevent the protein to synthesize and to be produced. So that why, that's why it's called silency or gene silency because the goal of therapy here is just one, silence the translation of the information into a protein. And it's, it can be done very effectively. And again, when do you use that technology is when the disease is driven by, like I said, the excess of a protein or the, um, a protein that is mutant and cause a problem. So that is gene silences. Uh, gene editing, and, uh, CRISPR is, or CRISPR-Cas is a way to do gene editing. Um, um, the revolution around CRISPR in the, in the labs, in the science a few years ago, had to do that it made gene editing very accessible, technically speaking, as opposed to what it was in the past that you had to have an incredible lab and it was a very complicated method. But the idea that they find, or they found this enzyme, and again, a sequence of RNAi attached to this enzyme that in this case goes into the nucleus of the cells, and is able to find that specific sequence and cut it and use a normal cell mechanism to repair that cut. So when you have a disease that the problem is a specific sequence within that DNA that makes that translate into an abnormal protein, as opposed to silence that protein, you can modify it by removing the sequence that is abnormal and enable the cell, the cell uh, repair that DNA and then start to translate into a normal protein. So that's kind of the, the main difference is the ability to change the DNA in a way that now will produce a normal protein. Um, people are working, for example, in sickle cell anemia really very difficult disease and there is work in gene therapy, there is work in CRISPR in which they try to modify the hemoglobin that is abnormal and therefore does not have those crises of uh, thrombotic events and anemia and so forth and, and acute pains and those type of issues. Um, there is this other disease that I mentioned that we have a drug for, the, the alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency in which CRISPR can modify the abnormal um, gene information, which in that case is only one amino acid that needs to be replaced. So there is already a clinical trial on CRISPR for this condition, and it for, it's, on, it's ongoing right now. There is another condition called amyloidosis, which is very similar concept. It's a liver condition. It has this misinformation that you can replace or, or modify using, using CRISPR or gene editing. So um, what is try to correct a gene in a way, uh, and so try to make it produce the right protein, 
Uh, and the other is just stop producing that gene because that protein is not helpful <laughs> in a way. You know, it's either causing disease or cause, causing some other pathological process that end up in a, in a disease. For example, uh, the concept about hypertriglyceridemia in itself is not a disease, but the consequence of it is. Um, instead of like sickle cell anemia, that that gene modification per se modify the, the hemoglobin and cause the disease. So, um, so that's, that's, that's the key, I think, differentiation between one technology and, and the other technology. Uh, uh, another critical difference, I think, is um, with RNAi, you need to do those every three to four months, uh, a new drug approved uh, called Clisiran. Uh, you can dose it every six months, but, but it's not a one-time intervention in contrast to gene therapy or gene editing that the idea is what well, you do it, and then that cells, you know, start to work with that process uh, indefinitely. And, and those are the reason why the field is advancing, but also you need to think about the long-term consequence of doing a gene editing in a given cell. And so the the feel I think is is moving really fast, and it's just just fascinating how fast in the last ten years these two con three concepts gene silencing, editing, and gene therapy have evolved. Certainly, uh, okay. Thank you for that. That was very helpful. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about RNAi in terms of you know where we were, how far we've come, and you know what do you see in say the next very near term in terms of its progress. Um, you know, talk us through that a little bit, where we are and where we're going. So in, in our name, Jedida, where we are, approximately five drugs, maybe a couple more, but come to my mind, five drugs are approved in the market. So that RNA interference, most of them from a company called Nylam, um, but all others as well. So, they are addressing or we're addressing a number of diseases in an effective and safe way. And we have, like I said, a, a robust pipeline for these liver targets. But as I said before, um, there are, may not be many more liver targets. So we had to get outside of the liver tissue and be able to deliver this drug specifically into different type of tissues. So, two components to make that successful. One, be able to deliver the RNAi double strand sequence, which is the, the drug itself is this 21 to 23 sequence of nucleotides um, delivered to the right tissue. That's the first thing that we need to um, achieve. And then find diseases where an expression of a given protein at that tissue is the problem. That's why we're looking in the lung at uh, this type of target, one is called RAGE, which is like a pro-inflammatory cytokine that is producing the lung and has a cascade of inflammatory events that trigger asthma as a, as a pathology, as a disease. So we are right at that moment to really define, and in preclinical animals, of course, we already tested this and we know that it's safe and we know that it's able to knock down or silence the, the target gene. So we do have the proof of concept in the preclinical work and we're moving into the translation into clinical work. Uh, and then the rest of the tissues, you know, muscle is another tissue where there are a number of diseases that are related to these type of issues. Um, then uh, CNS, as I said before, there are a number of conditions that are related to the excess of protein pro production. One example that is the most popular is Alzheimer's. And there are some type of Alzheimer's that the gene that caused the increase in amyloid in the brain is known. So it's thinkable that you can, if you can reach to that deep brain area, it can be transformative. And the other disease in the CNS that I think is an incredible opportunity, but yet the challenge is Huntington disease. Huntington disease is a really um, dramatic condition and is caused by the repetition of three sequences, which are always the, th the three called Huntington genes or sequence. So if you are able to cut that, um, well, then you stop producing the, tox the toxin protein that causes the disease. The problem is you need to go deep into the brain. 
And so what will be the mechanism by which you can deliver safely and with enough amount to the target area of the brain in a way that you prevent that disease. But the promise I think is huge. We, you know, the RNA interference was known for a while and it took easily, I would say uh, about 10 years since it was conceived as a therapeutic modality to find the right receptor and protein to reach the liver specifically. So it wasn't obvious from the beginning. It's this GALAC um, receptor that is what makes the drug get into the, into the cell. Uh, so now we're looking at that. The next, the next frontier is how we can deliver this drug at the muscle, at the CNS, we're testing the lung, and then the other tissue, because if you get to that point, then the number of targets that you can consider address is, again, is multiple. So the field of RNAi will expand beyond the liver, and that will be a whole new, a whole new therapeutic modality uh, that could be transformational such as gene therapy and gene editing. I think this is much more simple. It's, it's easier to track the safety concept. It's reversible uh, and it's using a natural process. So it's just giving the information to select that sequence that corresponds to a gene. But once that happens, the rest is normal biology, it's normal physiology. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I think, one of the beauty that makes it so predictable. Before we wrap up the formal end of our, our podcast, I just want to make sure that we have gotten to and covered everything regarding Arrowhead's pipeline. I know we talked about it extensively at the beginning, but is there anything you want to wrap up with about the pipeline going forward? So uh, in the clinic, um, maybe I, I didn't mention we have another program on phase one, um, complement three or C3, <clears throat> which is a mediator of a number of immune diseases. So that, that has... Um, a huge potential for conditions such as uh, PNH and some renal inflammatory diseases. So that's another one. Um, and then there are a number of work that we're doing uh, in the basic science with regard to ophthalmology delivery, CNS delivery, muscle delivery. So we are looking at that next generation. Uh, our current I would call late stage development, the alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency liver disease, the two cardiometabolics that we have right now, and then the C3, they're all ongoing and advancing into what we call end of phase two, uh, some point next year. When you, when you say end of phase two, that means you get to the FDA and say, well, let's agree upon the final step to get the drug to the market or to at least file the information for the FDA to evaluate whether that drug deserves to be in the market. So we're in that transformation from being a science research-based company to be a science research clinical development, fully commercial company over the next few years, which is a very, uh, a very great time to be in a company when that is happening. For sure, and we'll be, uh... At Dylan Jean, we'll be watching the progress and certainly hope you and your team will come back and talk to us about how far you've come since this, since the recording of this podcast, certainly. Great. Uh, so we've kind of come to the formal end of the podcast, the episode, and um, I always ask my guests a question to give our listeners a little bit of insight into who they are when they're not in the office or the lab. And so your LinkedIn profile says you are from Buenos Aires. And my question for you is, what do you miss most about Home, although I'm sure home now is, you're in the LA area, right? So what do you miss? And then what do you love most about the LA area? Yeah, so uh, you, you said it exactly right. I feel that I belong to both places. I feel local in both places. I live long enough in both places and I really love both. Uh, in Buenos Aires, Argentina, I have my entire family. That's where I train as a physician. I did my residencies and I work as a clinician for about 10 years. So at the beginning, when I moved, I moved to Indianapolis because Lily was my first company. And at that point, I missed everything <laughs> because the difference was so, so far apart. But definitely my family, I still have all my family there, my friends from my entire life. Uh, and the very lively uh, living style that you have in Buenos Aires, it's a beautiful city. And that city with friends and family is a good, it's a good place to be. 
but I always loved the ocean. And for the very first day that I landed in LA, I felt like I wanted to live here. It, it's hard to explain, but obviously one of the reasons is the ocean. I love the ocean. And when I'm not working, I, I do have a boat here in the marina and I go sailing to Catalina Island. Um, I love the ocean and go to the beach and uh, my daughters are here. And well, as you know, the weather is fantastic. And I like the, the, the lifestyle that when you're not working, you feel you're on vacation. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful feeling. Do you get to go back to Buenos Aires at all? Every year. Um, so my mom, my brother, sister, like I said, friends, Look, the FaceTime or, or, or whatever uh, video conference that is essentially free <clears throat> changed the life of all of us who are sure. away from our country because now this becomes a very normal thing. So when I landed in Buenos Aires Airport after a year of not seeing them, it looked like, why saw you yesterday? So, you know, it changed, uh, but I do go every year. Um, I do help a couple of startup companies there. Uh, you know, it's always... Uh, decided that you want to, to give back. I went to medical school and I didn't pay any money. It was the state and it was a really good medical school that enabled me to get to this point. But what well, this was the foundation that allowed, enabled me to get to this point. So I'm very thankful. So I already had tickets for this year, Christmas break. Congratulations on them, That's but right. are you able to comment on them in any way or is that sort of for a later time? Um, you know, one is a simple thing. It's like a nephew that is an amazing vegan chef. And he um, was 20 years old, he's 20 years old, and he had an Instagram thing. And I said, look, I think you, I think you have something that is so unique. And I know Argentina is not the typical vegan destination because steak and meat is a huge deal. But there is that niche of young people that care about this. So, so we are getting into a bigger operation with, you know, kitchen and commercial and all that. And then I serve in a board of uh, a smaller startup organization to help them decide where to put money. That's in Argentina too. Um, so yeah, but that's kind of, uh, again, like give back and fun and, and keep my mind open. <laughs> that's wonderful. You're a busy man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. And uh, keep us posted too on the uh, the vegan startup. That sounds fascinating. Uh, we'd love to hear more about it as it grows. I'll, I'll send you an email later. <laughs> that's great.